It is great to be back here on Inside LAFC, the Max and Vince podcast. We were gone for one week. Whole week. A whole week. We weren't here at glorious Alhambra. How many people reached out to you and said, what, no podcast? One. <laughs> yeah, like two. <laughs> they needed, I, you guys need to recharge your batteries as well, right? Yeah. So o Only um, so much Vince and Bretto so they can take. Yes. We're still a ways away from a game, so we're taping this on uh, the Tuesday. And no game this weekend. But we do have the uh, Seattle game the following week, which is obviously a big one. Huge. Next home game, Red Bulls the following Sunday. And uh, then it's back to normal. Uh, Vince LaRosa, Max Barreto. It's a reminder for you to rate, review, subscribe, and download the podcast. Staff game is going on. We have a very special Fired guest. Up. Yeah, that'll be going on. That's going to be the soundtrack for our show. Mm -hmm. Gavin Benjafield, the uh, performance director. You're really going to want to stick around to hear what he has to say. Not all soccer clubs, certainly not all MLS clubs, have a performance director who oversees the fitness, the diet, mm -hmm. everything, the challenges that every club will have. And the more you think about it, it's an endless list that uh, it's a real luxury. It shouldn't be a luxury, but LAFC has it. And we'll, you'll see what he does, and you'll be blown away about the responsibility he has. Yeah, you said we had no games, but we put our heads together, you and I, with Sarah Takata, head of broadcast, and we were like, this should be the person to talk to. And I, I honestly have been like, oh, my God, this is probably going to be one of the most interesting com conversations for our fan base because of, one, the way the season's gone a little bit. There was a couple injuries, a density period, which Gavin will talk about. But, two, like you said, I can't – after having talked to him, I can't imagine a team that does not have that. Like, can you imagine? I can't imagine. They're flying I cannot blind. Imagine. They're flying completely it's terrifying. blind. Yeah. I, I, high school should have this. High school, when you're – it's such a formative uh, – year of your athleticism you need someone like that to tell you what to eat to how to take care of your body so that you can take that next step and we're nowhere near that but that's something that if you're certainly playing at a higher level and if you're a soccer player that has aspirations to play in this league or play for this club something you're going to pursue so you're going to enjoy this conversation and maybe some stuff can rub off on you i know it certainly will on us but this was a big week for the club in this i know there's no games but didn't you notice when we talked to Steve Cherundolo on a couple occasions, it seemed like he had that marked. He goes, I can't wait to tell the guys, have some time off, get well. When we come back on the end, other end, hopefully everybody will be healthy. Escobar, Tajuri Shradi, Eddie Segura, who we yeah. talked to in, in depth with uh, Gavin Benjafield. And this was a, a good week, 10 days to get well. And, and more than anything, well, maybe not more than anything, but part of it, just to decompress, get away from the sport for a little bit, to get ready for this very challenging stretch ahead. Yeah, I mean, that's one thing that we didn't even really touch on with Gavin is the emotional aspect. And that's something we could have him on for a whole nother podcast to talk about, guys. Attitudes going into things, the, the emotions. Touch on it a little bit with Eddie. We said, you know, sometimes it's good for a guy just to hang out with the guys, right? Feel part of the group, especially when you're in a long-term injury. But you're right. It felt like... It felt like the Will Ferrell um, meme, the anchorman, like, wow, that escalated quickly. Because yeah. that's how the season went. It was like, we were going, oh, a couple games, uh, there's a, a couple days off. And then all of a sudden, May came and just punched us right in the nose. Came out okay-ish. I think a lot of fans first, would say. First place in the league. Would say, yeah, a lot of fans would say not good enough. Fine, you can have your opinion. Some would say just right. I, I'd say it's a little above bit of average. good, a little bit of It was above average. Yes, we're still top of the table. But, yeah, I think. A lot of the guys, and having just talked to a couple guys, I saw Ilya Sanchez and some guys, and they were just like, we're, we're raring, we're ready to go. Like, it, it's the hunger now, right? Because now they're like, oh, man, we haven't had games for a week and a half. I need to play. I want to play. Plus, I think they get a little sick of training. Oh, everyone gets sick of training. Yeah. Training's no fun. Although, it is fun here a lot, and it's a great... It's fun for us, because we're not running. And by, I, I, That's not lip service. We really miss being here. I love it here. I know Vince loves it here. To be with the guys, you have endless conversations, which... Uh, endears you more and more to this great group of players and coaches and performance directors that we have here. There are some guys that aren't here, and for a very good reason. Mm -hmm. Ecuador preparing for uh, the World Cup. They had a game against Mexico. I, it escapes me who they played prior to that, but we'll, we'll get to that. Feisty game. Jose yes, Cifuentes nice. started both games. Yeah. Chiqui Palacios was on the bench, did not get off, but Jose Cifuentes clearly... Gustavo Alfaro is looking at him because this is a big dress rehearsal stretch for these teams. And you're playing good opponents if you are Ecuador. And it pretty much tells me, I'm not saying he's going to start for Ecuador, but if you're starting these two games and you look at the guys he's playing alongside, he's playing alongside Pervis Estupiñan and Moises Caicedo, that uh, you're going to be on that plane. 
And that's huge for our two Ecuadorian internationals. Both have a real shot. We can't confirm that, but both have a real shot to be there. Uh, Chiqui Palacios, the problem with him playing is that he's behind uh, one of the best left backs in the world, and it's Tupinan, but they're still going to need someone to cover him. So good, good sense in that one. Yeah, I think it means if he's taking this look at him, he's taking a long look, and like you said, it's just a very good chance. Because we, you and I talked about it just kind of through text. We were like, man, I can't believe... Cheeky can't get a, a minute right now because he's, he is in such good form. I did text him about that. But then Sifu, who we think has roller coastered a little bit, he, I think he's gotten better as the season's grown on. He is, is like number one on the team sheet, it seems like. And I said to Max, I go, well, maybe it's just a player like Sifu is so interesting in the international game. A midfielder that can stitch things together, that covers a lot of ground, scores some goals, can hit a long range shot. I think you need that type of guy in international competition. So it's not that his path is easier, it's just his profile makeup. And then also, you know, there's three spots in that midfield as opposed to Cheeky. Correct. Can only play left back, really. Uh, maybe you could play a little midfield, but their midfield just so good. That's what I'm saying. Ecuador's uh, got a great midfield. They're one to watch out for in, in the World Cup. They're in that first group, so you'll see them right at the beginning with uh, the Netherlands, Senegal, and Qatar. So uh, that's a very exciting development. Kellen Acosta did not play. He had a bit of a, a setback, but he's with the U.S. team. They have a couple more games. He'll, he was on the bench against He was on the bench, Uruguay, we should so. say, against Uruguay. Didn't get off of that. But uh, stock rising for the, uh, the U.S. as they beat Morocco. Scoreless game with Uruguay. Kellen Acosta, I heard, saw his name bandied about because of his versatility, and there's some holes with the U.S., that his participation is, is going to be defined, and he much like he does with LAFC, may see some minutes in other positions. I would think at the left back spot because they don't have cover for Anthony Robinson. Maybe Greg Berhalter looks at Kellen Acosta and go, you're not going to be a featured player, but you could get minutes here. You could get minutes there. Yeah, I think regardless of whatever shape he's in, uh, I think the reason why we're not seeing much of him is your point. Greg Berhalter looks at him and goes, I'm going to need you one way or the other. I don't know how. It'd be crazy. But I'm going to need you, especially with, you know, the, the conditions, the amount of games. I, I just think that he's, he's basically, he's on the plane. I, I, got I mean, he wouldn't say that, but I would say he's on the plane. He is on the plane. Maxime Crepo, Daniel Henry with the Canadian national team. Unfortunately, they did not have a game. They had a, a cancellation against Iran. Panama came in. The players decided not to play that game as they are trying to work out a, a, something, something along the lines of a new CBA to get aligned with the women's game, much like they did with the, here in the United States. It, it, it's a stand that they could be proud of, but Canada needs games. Because, uh, by the way, I was watching... Hey, but I'll say this. Uh, on the Angels Wear Boots show on 110 Football, which is the covering Angel City, Lauren Sesselman, who is a World Cup veteran, played for the Canadian Canada. national team, she applauded what the men did because she said that's so important for them to take a stand to help align the women's game with the men's game because when, unfortunately, sadly, it's when the men step out and, and start to talk sometimes that really these federations take notice. And so she was proud of them. And that was a proud moment for her um, to see the men's team step up for the women's team who, let's be real, has been very, very good for a long time. This women's Canada, gold, gold this, medalist yeah, at the Olympics. This men's team, we, everyone's talking about, oh man, Canada's gonna be good for a while. The women's team's been good for a long time and very good. So And also where them. they good got their them. coach, John yep. Herdman, was with the women's team. He's breaking all sorts of barriers by what he is doing. And I agree with Lauren, and it, it's, a, it's a wonderful gesture, uh, more so because it was such a big spot for Canada to get a game because it's going to be tough to fill off the rest of their calendar. And the reason I say it, I watched Belgium play and I watched Croatia play, and they're in Canada's group. They're... You're right they're for the taking, ripe you think? for the taking because they're very talented, but they're older in the tooth. Mm -hmm. They haven't recycled in new young players or ideas. is already complaining about how many games he's got to play. Yeah, I've said they. Sh I think they'll be competitive. I'm not saying they advance, but they'll be competitive. Hey, if you can zone. get out and run, and you can pressure these teams and, and make them uncomfortable, anything can happen in the World Cup. So all said, the five LAFC players that uh, are World Cup potentially bound, it looks pretty firm for all five of them. We should see uh, some more than others. Obviously, Sifu at the top of that list. Did want to mention how, how proud I was to see Diego Rossi and his historic rise coming on for Uruguay. Looks like he is in the plans for them at the World Cup. And his time with LAFC had to be a big part of that rise. You can't deny it. It's, he's been at Fenerbahce for one year, but whatever he did at LAFC to work on his game, he became a, a fringe player to now a national team player. Diego Alonso knows what... MLS has. 
He knows what he can bring. I remember when they were on the broadcast, they go, it looks like Diego Rossi's coming in. I was waiting to see him step up, and then I saw, ooh, he's wearing that number nine. Wearing that number nine. It looked good. Famous. It looked really good. Um, that made me so happy. What did make me a little less happy was that Diego was playing as like a right or left midfielder. So there was times I was like, I can't think of many times where Diego Rossi's been 18 yards from his goal for long periods of time when he was with LAFC. But they'll, they'll figure it out. I'm just glad that he's there. Um, and I think that Diego Rossi being there and Diego Alonso being there means that we talked about five guys that are already with their national teams and have a very good chance of being on that plane. Could be that sixth guy. And the way Brian has come back from his injury, the way that he has played, I think they're going to have a, a, an eye on him because Diego Alonso knows, again, knows what MLS has. And if Brian, the trajectory that he's on, because I, I, I still think... Great season. without injury. I mean, the San Jose game was finally where he actually got on the score sheet and contributed an assist. But even coming in just in the little brief cameos before that, he looks a different player. He does. His head's right, and he is committed, and he is very beloved here. I got one more for you. Kim Moon Hwan, right back, started for Korea in a victory over Chile. Korea's going to go there. And remember when he, he wanted to get back into the good graces of his World Cup team, and LAFC did their best to facilitate that, mm -hmm. and it's working out. Yeah. He's back in there. You got to say, we, we talked about this way back when, when he left, um, but we kind of extrapolated it all around a lot of guys. When these guys get moved on, LAFC does seem to find a nice soft landing they do. spot for them. They don't have to. They don't have to. We talked that about uh, uh, Walker Zimmerman, who is now very The wealthy. highest paid defender in the league. Playing at Nashville, which has got a brand new stadium. And Tristan Blackman, obviously Vancouver struggling, but that was a great club for Tristan. But also got a nice long-term contract. Got a nice Mark Anthony K also got a nice long-term contract immediately. So clubs don't have to do that. No, I've seen it many times where they don't, where they do it with much vigor and go ha. Ah! Grin and bear it. It's about the people. Look, I mean, I know everyone says it. It's it's people first before you bring in the player, and LAFC says that, and I, I agree that they do that to to an extent. Obviously, the player trumps all how much they can contribute to the team, but. I, I, I will say that in seeing the way they've moved some guys on, it has made it a little bit more readily present in my mind that they actually do mean it when they say it's about the person and the relationship that they've had with that person. And I've told you many times that I think that's important just in general, even in, from a selfish manner, because if you're looking at a guy that's saying, hey, man, I think I'd like to go to LAFC, but I really have bigger dreams and blah, blah, blah. How are you going to get me there? They'll say, look. We brought guys in, we moved them along as quickly as we could. We brought guys in that didn't quite work out, and we still moved them to somewhere else that they could feel where they were made whole, whether it was through a contract or a different situation. I think that goes a long ways because, one, these guys have a lot of the same agents, and, two, they all talk. Yeah. So there, it, it's something. It, it, does it help LAFC on the field? Probably not. But when LAFC goes out there and their messaging is we're a family and we, we look to make people whole, they're doing it. They're certainly doing that. Can't really talk about games. We'll talk a little bit you more. You want to talk about the staff game? The staff game. How's it looking? I saw Thornton. He's wearing the the, we got, uh, the orange Jordan, jumper. Jordan Harvey making a it's a full game. run. It's a full game. Okay. Unfortunately, oh, you, probably, you, you probably can't see it really well. It's yeah, pretty, probably pretty fuzzy. It is a fun thing. It's we good. should do one where we just broadcast a staff game. Uh, I don't it's know funny if they say us. that. I was asked uh, by uh, Jeff Huber to possibly do it, and I said I need some prep, and uh, I need to pay me. <laughs> <laughs> of course. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I was about to say I'll I'd do, do that it, one on I would do it for lunch, but I will do that for a, yeah, a lunch here. Which uh, we should do it. Okay. You guys tell us. Would a good podcast should we be broadcast the staff game? Mm -hmm. We'll have a sideline reporter. We'll we'll go all in. Watch the first one we broadcast is the one that everyone just starts going down injured, and then uh, the game ends early, and then I, we'll never be asked to do it again. My perfect dental records were ruined in a staff game. Okay. True story. So we can't really talk about games, but we can talk about is the. That news, and it may become official <laughs> by the time you hear this podcast, if we're taping it on a Tuesday, maybe hear it on Thursday, Giorgio Chiellini. Uh, it's all out there. Uh, it's not stamped and confirmed here by the club, but uh, it nothing is. Nothing is done until you see that cap. Tip. Nothing is done. But we used to be nothing is done until you see the player holding the jersey, but we know at LAFC it's nothing is done until you see that cap tilt. This is going to be an exciting cap tilt, and we saw him in the finalissima uh, for Italy. Uh, his kind of his farewell what do you think there. Think about that. I gotta say, I watched it later because it was at the same time. Was at the same time as the USA game. Mm -hmm. uh, 
I think it's great for those countries, more so Argentina as they're getting ready for a world. It was great for Argentina. Yeah. Didn't seem like it kind of showed off Italy, the issues that they are certainly dealing with. I would say generally you couldn't have picked two clubs to, or two clubs, two countries to be have a better product because Argentina does take these things so seriously. Italy normally does, but like you were saying, because they're not in a World Cup, it was a little tough. You could tell. Um, and Giorgio only played the first half. I know a lot of people were getting uh, at me saying, oh, look. Look yeah. what happened to him against Di Maria. If you want to really break down that play, look at, look at uh, Leonardo Bonucci and how Lotaro Martinez held him off yeah. and created a 2v1, I mean, in that moment. And then I'm worried about Gigi Donnarumma. Yeah. I thought he was an elite goalkeeper, and I'm terrified. I now. got a lot of grief when I said I didn't think he was an elite goalkeeper. Then he, You might be right. Then he had the <laughs> – you were one of them. I was like, yep. I just don't see it. Uh, I think he's really good, but – what we were calling him, the focus seems to be a problem. He had the, the the penalty shootout against England in the Euro final, and that was it. But then since then, nothing really redeeming in and some really bad plays, not only for country but for club, mm -hmm. that have the alarm bells ringing. But what I did take out of that game is that Argentina can really win the World Cup. Not just that, but the next game, Argentina gets five goals from Lionel Messi. There's something about that team that looks like they're going to be very tough to crack. Yeah. I, I would be terrified. I think, did you and I, you and I, when we did like way too early predictions, we both said we thought Argentina would win it because we were like, oh, we want to go Brazil. No, because I think we both had Brazil and then we we're like, let's change it up. I went to Argentina. Did you go somewhere? I went somewhere else. I think I went Spain. Spain. Oh. I'll change it. But it's. Uh, Spain could be, still be good. I looked at it and I. Gavi I, scoring, youngest yeah, goal scorer in Spain. Let's not bring up Gavi. No? <laughs> Wasn't he in the middle of the whole. Well, not him, but his, his mother. Anyway, we'll, we'll skip that. Gagavi, Shakira. No, let's talk about it. Everyone want, That's what that's they what, want us to talk we'll about. Get a big, we'll get a big spike in our, our numbers here. Yeah. But uh, I looked at it, and I think there's a possibility. The best story at the World Cup, in my estimation, and I, and I think I'm 100% right, is if you can, and it's not far-fetched, and I looked at the bracket, and if they win their groups, it could happen. Argentina, England, World Cup final. It's not crazy that could happen. No. No, I mean, I have Argentina beating the United States in the quarterfinals in, in uh, one bracket I did. Yeah, England so. obviously went to a Europe. I think the big thing for England is going to be the weather and how they deal with the conditions. Argentina is going to be no stranger to crazy conditions because, as we said, anytime that the World Cup travels outside of Europe, it seems like the Come Bowl teams do very, very well. So you would already kind of write in Brazil, Argentina to be one of those teams. But England, I could see it. I was talking on my Soccer OG podcast, and we're talking about Qatar, and it's the size of Connecticut, and you're going to have all these state-of-the-art venues. And there's a chatter that some people are trying to see three games in one day, which is possible if you could do it. So uh, that's going to be an interesting experience. But it's going to be unlike any World Cup we've had, which I tend to think will even the playing field a bit. Mm -hmm. So maybe Argentina-England's a bit of a long shot. Maybe, it's, maybe we get a first-time winner. That'd be cool. But a real out, you know, an outsider, an African team, a CONCACAF team. That's not happening. <laughs> wow. I'm doing the math. Pour cold happening. water on that I'm right sorry. away. Maybe all, a semifinal. All the USA fans that are watching this Mexico fans. Maybe you can get fans. Senegal or USA or, or Canada in the semifinals, yeah. but that's probably not going to be Mexico. But Chiellini, it's, it's going to happen. Mm -hmm. And there are, you know, reports projecting that he could finally get in sometime in early... July. Well, the Maybe soonest that Galaxy he can game play, is the soonest one. The soonest he can play would be the Galaxy game. Yeah. So uh, how is he going to be used? We don't know for sure. I Scoring think the winner at home against the Galaxy. We do know this, and to me, it's the best part of it all is the mentoring aspect because you have a lot of young defenders here. Obviously, Mama Dufal comes to mind. He's 19. Eddie Segura is still a very young defender. Mm -hmm. Chiki Palacios isn't a center back, but as a left back, could learn so much about positioning. You name it from a guy like Giorgio Chiellini. So the mentoring, if for some reason, uh, knock on wood, he, he picks up an injury, he could still provide that from a content side, which is great news for us. Uh, it, the, He's the a great sky's guy. The limit. Speaks English. Uh, I would say. Gregarious. Yes. Check out. If you have Amazon Prime, check out that Juventus All or Nothing. Go directly to the second episode. And I think it's maybe like. 15 minutes in, maybe a little less, Giorgio Chiellini has the chance. Uh, he works heavily with uh, the Special Olympics uh, and a lot of groups out there in Italy. And uh, in that episode, it's coming out of the pandemic, and he hadn't had a chance to see the kids that he had worked with in, I, I think, almost a year. And just the reunion of those kids and him 
Um, it's one of those moments, and Max and I have been around for a while. We're kind of cynical in this regard. I, Max, when you see it, you, you'll probably tear up. Because when you Thank see these kids in um, the warmth, it's, he, you can tell he's not just there for a flyby. He really cares about them, and he missed them over that period. So that's the type of person you're getting off the field. Uh, and I'll add on to your mentoring. It's, an, it's being an intermediary as well. Because we have a lot of young defenders that we think Mama Dufal, Eddie Segura, that we think one day could move on to Europe and, and be uh, a high-ticket player, not just a guy that goes there for five so million, a dollar sign three million. To this, that he but, can help but here's the thing: clubs are not very creative. European clubs, as much as they're good, they're not super creative. So they're going to look and say, "Well, what center backs have come out of MLS that we should really be looking at?" And there's not really many comps. But if you have a guy like Giorgio Chiellini calling up Pavel Nedved at Juventus and saying, hey, "Hey, man, recreate that phone conversation really quick." No, I'm not going to do it. Hey, Pavel. I'm not allora, going yeah, to do it. I'm not going to do it. Just, hey, mama do fall. just so you, you, when you show it to him, he'll go, that's your Italian <laughs> accent? He's like, and you're Italian? How dare you? But no, to call, to, honestly, to call up and say, look, it's not just what you've seen on tape. I've been training with this kid. I know from what I've done at Juventus for 15 years, this kid can do it. They'll listen. Like the, the word of former players and the word of, of people in the game, especially that are held with such regard as Giorgio Chiellini, people will listen. Um, and again, not, not, I mean, there's not really any clubs at MLS that have that kind of player in their midst that can sell on players. I mean, what we've seen so far is what's the best thing to have is a, a parent club, whether you're Red Bull or you're the city group, we're doing it a little bit different way. Yeah. We, <laughs> you don't have that behind you, but you find creative ways to do it. People know and trust Giorgio Chiellini. There will be eyes on this club because he's here, not just from the Italian press, but the worldwide press because that's how much of a beloved fi figure he is. He is not going to be a DP. He's going to be a pretty resourceful signing for a club whose uh, salary is not... Left-footed. Left-footed left -footed center back. Remember that. It's important. Rare. Rarefied air. Uh, how, what is his usage going to be like? Well, is it going to... I would, I would imagine it's not going to be he's going to go and travel to every game. Doesn't really need it. You have center backs if they're we all healthy. We have enough center backs where we don't have a big core that you hope will get better because of his presence alone. Mm -hmm. But in those positions, he can come in and uh, provide extra cover or a solid 90 minutes in a specific game that you need him. That sounds great. When I hear myself say it, Vince, yeah. it sounds like a no-brainer. I know. I feel like we talked ourselves into it a little bit, but then... Because a lot of people aren't on board with it. A lot I of people... Know, but, but this is what they say. Well, you know, a lot of travel. I go, what if he doesn't travel? What if he doesn't have well, to? Well, the altitude and the temperature. What if he doesn't go to uh, Salt Lake or Houston? Well, those people aren't wrong when they say, yeah, well, is he going to be able to play in July in Houston? What about the travel? And you go, yeah, you're right. Well, it would take a club that has a lot of center backs. Oh, guess what? <laughs> uh, and then they say, well, you know, but if he's playing less games, how impactful he's going to be? Well, maybe it would take a club that is top of the Sporter Shield ranking yeah. right now. I mean, come on. These things are, this is, it, it's a, in a way, it's a necessity, but also a luxury and only a, a club that in the position that LAFC is in with the group, with the standing, uh, with the ownership group could really honestly pull off, I think. And pull it off to a way that all those people saying, what about this? What about this? It won't come to fruition in those ways. I will say this too. It's an 18-month, right? Year, mm -hmm. year and a half deal is what we're hearing. Uh, what if one of these talented young defenders catches the eye of another club and something has to happen quickly? You're not – you have time to find the next player. That's not far-fetched. Mm -hmm. These guys, you know, whether it's Fall or Palacios and that's on the center back or even Eddie Segura, if he gets healthy and he shows that he's in the same form, these are guys that are already in the eyes of the marketplace. And as we've seen in MLS, sometimes there's these deals that come along where it's big money and teams go, ah, we're going to hold off for another six right. months so we get another guy in. And guess what? It's half Got the price six in. months later. Yeah, cheers to that. So there you go. We vetted this thing out from every angle. So uh, That's what they pay Max and I for. <laughs> I, we'll, we'll, we'll hold off on the conversations for the game, but we know that Seattle game is big and a lot of people will be traveling, so we'll get you ready for that in the next Inside LAFC MVP podcast. But we want to get to the Gavin Benjafield conversation. That's coming up next. We'll be right back. Make sure you rate, review, subscribe, download. You know the drill. Leave a review or I'll be very upset. I won't be upset. Just leave a review. No, he will be. Do it. He sends me texts in the middle of the night, so do it. We're back here on Inside LAFC, the Max and Fins podcast. And a thrill to welcome in a man who has been with the club from the beginning, the performance director of LAFC, Gavin Benjafield. And we have the, uh, the world-famous staff game going on here. Do you ever partake? I have, but I choose not to because the risk of injury is too high. <laughs> Case in point, I would have to gun to you. You can't see there, but uh, my tooth was chipped 
in the first staff game I played in. Well, there you go, sir. Good yeah. to be on this side of the fence. There. <laughs> Did you know Max is banned from staff games? <laughs> Apparently, I'm banned. I heard something about a two-footed tackle and. Uh, uh, Max is Max is. It's banned. Ante Razov. He's got a. He's got a. Yeah. Own to pick with me, but there it is. Uh, this is an interesting week. It's some players are off on international duty. We'll talk about that and. Some guys are off just recuperating after a very busy stretch. Uh, we have it eight games in 28 days, which is a lot. And that's where the eyes turn to you as for the club. So when you see that on the schedule, what is the preparation like to know you have to get the width and breadth of this team through that very, very difficult stretch? It's a challenge. I mean, clearly we know the schedule well in advance. So as soon as that thing gets posted, we're on our computers and we're kind of projecting what the entire season looks like. Yes, there's the anomalies of Open Cup. Are you advancing or not advancing? So you have a scenario A and a scenario B. And so we had the whole month of May planned out and we knew exactly, okay, advance through the first round of the Open Cup, what's the second round and how many games. And then you've got to navigate that. The, some of the challenges, I mean, there, there are more than one, but some of the challenges are in March we had three games, then we had five games, and then we jumped up to eight games. So players like rhythm. They like, if it was... Four games, six games, six games, I would have smiled because there's a rhythm in that and there's a development. But to jump from three, five, and eight, that's quite a big ask from the players. So you have to use those weeks prior to the eight as, and get as much training in as possible because when you get to eight games, training just Don't goes train. out the window. Yeah. Exactly. You're just going from game to game. So the guys that aren't getting the minutes, they really lose a lot because what's their exposure like? So, yeah, we had some players that just didn't smell any minutes and didn't get any minutes and you literally just... Even with creative ways of topping them up, you see their fitness dropping. And the other guys that have to just go from game to game, it's like you're holding on for dear life. So you almost have like two groups? 100%. In that situation? Yeah. Yeah, there are two groups, and the guys that are not getting the minutes are having to do a little bit of extra after each of those training sessions. You do sometimes have to take risks because, like, what happens if a guy goes down early in the game? but you actually pushed the guy that was on the bench the day before. So, yeah, there, there are some areas where you're taking risk. If I could just follow up about when guys are not getting games and you, you say the creative ways to fill that in, but made it, you made it sound like there's no real great way of doing it. Yep. But what can you do and what kind of void is left by the players who are training and training but not going to that intensity of a game? So it comes down to the relationship again with the players. You've got to explain to them, hey, we're going into this period. You're going to feel this. So therefore, that's why we're doing this. So sometimes you'll see guys post-game doing some runs. Um, you'll see, maybe you don't, but the day before a game, maybe we're doing something extra with those guys. Uh, they don't necessarily get the off days that the other guys get off. They're doing something on, on their own at home. So it's really trying to keep them at the optimum level but there's nothing like a hard quality yeah. training session and then a hard quality game to kind of bump up that game fitness. I mean, this is a big topic around the world, especially now as we have a winter World Cup. Yep. There's guys that are playing in these Nation League games and a lot of top footballers are complaining about the amount of football that they're playing. You talked a little bit about rhythm, but eight games in 28 days. I mean, how long can you sustain that? I mean, if you did, what would be your preference? How would, how would, we, do, how would we manage these things? Yeah, so... I find eight as too many. I mean, there are some teams. And so we were we were one of four teams in the month of uh, March, April, May. Uh, so in the month of May, that did the eight games. So I looked at Western Conference teams and how many. So it wasn't as though it was like everyone was doing it. There was one team that had four games, okay? Mm -hmm. Probably two less league games, and they got knocked out of the Open Cup quite early. But I would prefer being at that six kind of capacity. That would basically mean that you're playing one game every weekend and then there's a double header either the first or the third week or the second or the fourth. That would be a lot more manageable. And I think, especially with the MLS, there's travel that you've got to remember. I mean, we did East Coast trips, so there's a ton of flying, there's time zone differences, then you go to altitude. And you did have an altitude game recently, you had a exactly. Colorado game. That's right. So. All those factors add to the complexity of guys' recovery, mm -hmm. where Europe is like, okay, I'm not going to say it's easier there, but weather is maybe a little bit more tempered and travel, shorter. travel is shorter. Yeah. So those are kind I was, of I was actually going to ask you that, because you look at a team like Liverpool, Manchester City, comes yeah. around February and they know February every year we're probably playing a game every three days. That's right. But is that even possible in MLS to sustain a February to May where it's like every three days with those extra externalities that you brought up? So, I mean, we track obviously a whole bunch of things. And so the last game that we played, the San Jose game, 
you would think that game one is your highest output and game eight is your absolute lowest output. It's not like that. I do think I said to the guys when there was only two games left, I was like, you know, like if you go for a run and you pass the halfway mark and you know that, it, hey, I'm almost there. You almost get that second wind. Mm -hmm. And you're like, hey, it's not that bad. Yeah. I almost feel like the players get to that where like games maybe three, four, and five were sometimes some of the toughest because they were like, well, we have so not deep enough in it and it's still so far away. But now maybe games six, seven, and eight were a little bit mentally easier to overcome. Um, there is an, it's certainly an increased risk of injury when that happens. So even though the output in that last game was quite high mm -hmm. in comparison to the other uh, seven games, the risk of injury just kind of compounds game on game because you know, you're going in fatigued, you're asking your body to do the same thing, but it costs you even more. It's harder. Mm -hmm. So consistency is key to have that. When yes. you have those, those shocks to the system where you go, uh, that thing's, that's where you get things challenging. But it, when I'm, we were talking to you and a performance director seemed like a luxury position for clubs not too long ago, just talking to you now seems like a necessity, especially in a league like this. How have you seen... Many MLS clubs don't have a sophisticated group like yep. they have here at LAFC. How have you seen the growth of that and how have uh, people like you uh, made it a necessity for other clubs and other, other parts of the league to, to do the same, to yep. protect the players, protect the product? 100%. I mean, it just it's second nature for me, having come from Europe um, where this has been around for so long, it's a position that you're almost looking at things from different angles compared to the coaches or maybe compared to the medical staff. And you're trying to forecast, you're trying to see be, before something happens and prepare guys before things happen. So yeah, when we were in the early stages, having those one games a week, I was saying, look, we're not prepared to play those two games in a week. We'd better kind of crank up, dial up the training so that we're giving them a bit of that early shock leading into games so that when we do get into the midweek games, because remember, we went really quickly to not midweek games, but four midweek games. So we had to do some kind of preparation for that. So yeah, the role does require you to do things that people are maybe not necessarily paying attention to. To follow up on Max's question, because it got my mind rolling to when you first joined, and I remember being back at the old uh, experience center yeah, that's right. um, and you, you know, being announced and having a chance to speak to all of us and tell us about your background. And I remember you saying, you know, you'd worked in England, you had worked in Holland, you worked all over the world, that you relish this challenge because uh, as much as you just said, you know, you brought over kind of the European where there's midweek games and yep. there's loading, uh, they were a little bit too hardened to some things. How have you seen now that you've been here, it's year five, how have you seen the, the openness to try new things and have you felt you've gotten to kind of spread your wings in that yep. way because that was something that you looked forward to. 100%. I mean, the, the one big attraction was coming where a club was starting from scratch and you had this opportunity to bring in ideas and kind of lay the foundation and then build on to that foundation. And yeah, at LAFC, it's been very accepted. Uh, great opportunities to work with uh, Bob Bradley and kind of even his acceptance to this. And now Steve, probably even a greater acceptance to uh, the ideas and the things that we're talking about. And it still remains probably one of the biggest challenges in my career is to work in the MLS and the difference of travel and altitude and heat and the dynamics and like how things change so quickly. Yeah, it's it's a challenge. We've learned a lot about all of this uh, being here at the Performance Center, including when you know when there's a game, right? Because we go to the, the cafe. Yeah, the food and is it's, different. Uh, it's all pasta it. and rice. <laughs> yeah, you know it's a game day before. We're like, hey, where's this? But it's where's this the salad? Is all very selective. And I and when you when you're ready to go to Colorado, it's amazing. There's beets for days everywhere. Absolutely. So you got to know about the food, which is just a big part about it as well. Yeah, as as a staff member, it's probably the worst time to be like minus one, and then also high density games. You can imagine it's just like carbs are there all the time. And so guys that are not playing, it's another challenge, and it's kind of <laughs> educating those guys because it's crazy. If you're just carbing, 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 but you're not expending it, then you're just like don't eat that. You're on vacation for a month. <laughs> so, so then you have to do education with them. So you're basically saying, hey guys, look. Over the next month, the food in there, I'm going to need you to touch less of this, get more of this. 100%. And even the catering we do post-games, we have like the high-carb version and then the moderate to low-carb version as well. So depending on if a guy played a certain number of minutes, he'd be pushed across to the high-carb version. And if a guy was sitting on the bench for the whole time and maybe did a couple of warm-ups in the corner, a couple of runs afterwards, yeah, you don't need that much carbs or that much nutrition uh, to recover because you didn't really do that much. And when they're at home, obviously they get to eat something of their yeah. own, but you still have to keep an eye on uh, yeah. exactly what is 
no, kind of a full-time no, nutritionist now has okay. like raised the level in terms of like what the guys are getting post-game, pre-game, the educational side behind it. So, yeah, we've definitely upskilled on yeah, that. Yeah, because I saw Ilya Sanchez eat a giant pepperoni pizza. I, saw, I don't want to be the telltale. I'm just kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> Okay. Do uh, you want to pivot to the, the injuries? Which I'm is still thinking about Ilya, Ilya just taking you around back and just <laughs> taking care of what I you deserve said. It. I deserve it. I deserve it. He I think we should pivot to, either. yeah, everyone wants to talk about, I think, Eddie Segura well, and his rehab and return because but, it's been a process. Right. And they've been, to tell you the truth, Gavin, they've been looking at Max and I going, you guys keep saying he's close, he's yeah, close, he's, he's close. close. He's close. And that's all we know in our parlance of how we can say things, but yeah. you can and, actually tell us how it's happened. he could have said he's close too, but that's a big part of your job as well yeah. to... Look, injuries are inevitable in football. So um, you're going to go through a season. There have been several studies that have kind of tracked European football across multiple seasons. I had the privilege of being in those meetings. It was a round table. I mean, I was sitting with the guys, the medical staff from Champions League teams. And once a year, we'd go there and we'd go like, hey, what are the injury trends happening? What's happening season to season? So, yeah, I have a wealth of knowledge in that and experience. And I was, yeah, really fortunate to be able to be part of that. So I brought some of that here. ACL injuries, horrific. Like for a player, you just know it happens and they're like, man, this is a long injury. It's one of the longest that have been around. There, there are a few maybe that go different injuries that are a little bit more complicated that kind of keep a guy out for uh, longer. But Just to cut you there, but that was a complicated one because when you first saw it, you didn't yeah. see the signs of the injury when the training staff, and he had to keep playing it, yeah. came out after, after a second look. Absolutely. I mean, Slatin is a great example right now um, of someone that has the ability to play without an ACL or partially ruptured ACL for months on end. Mm -hmm. um, and you see it in other sports as well. Uh, but Eddie, ACL injury, all right, then you start the clock. Okay, and then it's surgery, and then it's rehabilitation, and just explaining how so quickly post-surgery, the guys actually feel pretty functional, and they're like, hey, throw me in there, I'm ready to go. But from research and from everything and experience that we know is you can't put the guys in too early because the risk of injury is just way too high in those months four, five, six, seven. It's only really uh, month nine, 10, 11, and even after a year that that, that surgery has taken to its full strength, I call it like waiting for paint to dry. Like literally between months four and nine, he was just waiting for paint to dry mm -hmm. and be ready to be able to be put into full competition. But even now, so he is now in training. Yes. Um, he's able to do things that pretty much everybody on the, on the field is able to do, but he had no preseason. And if a player misses a preseason, you still got to give him one? How does it work? Yeah. So there are micro preseasons happening throughout the year. So, yes, everyone would like to jump on the same train. Destination is L.A., and the train goes at one speed and everyone's on there. But the reality is when a guy's injured, he kind of almost steps off that train. If he's off for a couple of days, maybe even just a week, no worries. Jump on the train. There's no problem to jump on to the moving train. But a guy that's been out for a couple of weeks, months, mm -hmm. so those guys that re-enter, they're almost micro pre-seasons that are happening. Eddie, yes is now coming back into training. This is his preseason that he's been involved in for the last couple of weeks. Um, and part of that process is also to get into his own head, like co your confidence levels, like how confident are you? Yeah, we can see, is he going into challenges? Is he not going into challenges? But just asking the athlete and when they're honest with themselves and they go like, I'm not ready yet, you got to honor that and make sure that he can be put into training situations where he can develop that confidence because that's a big part of the re-injury is when the player's not confident. And that's such a part of growth because maybe uh, it's a bit naive on my part. Historically, you'd always see these athletes, more so in the flow of games, I'm okay, I'm not coming out. Uh, are you seeing more, because of the conversations you have, are you seeing more athletes saying, okay, I'm not, I'm not 100%. Because every, there was this, this time where they, they would run through a wall, but now that they say, look, we're going through this checklist, you got to be honest with yourself so we make yep. sure you don't injure yourself further. It's player to player. Yep. It's still, you get some guys running through brick walls and you get some guys are actually probably a little too cautious. And you're like, hey, <laughs> to, to go from crawling to stumbling to walking, you had to have a couple of falls. I mean, parents with kids know that. Like, you can't prevent the grazes and the bumps and the bruises. That's part of the learning experience. And from crawling to walking, some of that had to happen. So, yes, you've got to... If you bubble wrap them the whole time, they're never going to be able to get back into competitive football. So one of the things that, I, that gets my mind going to now is if he's in his preseason, 
Um, I guess a benefit is when he gets into games, everyone's playing at a high level, so you know he's getting the intensity that he needs, he's getting yeah. the load that he needs. However, he's a defender. Mm. And in preseason, you get the chance to sub out guys uh, unlimited, um, play them an amount of minutes. You don't normally send a defender in for 15 minutes. So is it yeah. is it different for Eddie because – like an attacker, you'd say, hey, go get the next 10 minutes, exactly. cl close out this game. But when you put in a defender, unless you're up 4 or 5 nothing, it's, yeah. it's weird, right? Yeah, you typically don't see that. They go from like 0 to 90, and that's about it. So, again, creativity. So what does the second team schedule look like? Because there you can very much dictate. Like, we want him to play 45 minutes, and then that's it. doesn't matter how he's feeling. We want him to come out. There are friendly scrimmages. Maybe during a FIFA break, teams may choose to kind of have a friendly team come around. And... You're looking for those moments because, yes, to go from just training exposure to a full 90, yeah, there's a risk involved in that as well. When there is an injury, uh, the reaction from the entire staff, uh, including yourself, uh, you, you, I know you mentioned about checklists, but, you know, God forbid someone gets injured in a game. Yeah. How does that, how does that, that checklist look when you go, what are those conversations? As much as you could probably tell. Yeah. So think of Waterloo Station. It's like multiple trains, multiple stations. So yes, again, to that analogy of we'd like everyone just to be on a single track and going the entire season. But you're just like, all right, let's start the clock. What's going on? Uh, let's put him on this track. Projections. When do we think he can do that? And those are micro adjustments every single day. We, we keep calling it like weather forecasting. Maybe in LA it's a little easier because it's sunny <laughs> yeah, it's every single day. It's like when it rains, we all get surprised, but it's because we never check our weather apps. Yeah. Like in another country, it's you like it can fluctuate one to the other. So we're always checking. But forecasting is like based on today's reaction, what do we think you can do tomorrow? You have a kind of global plan. But yes, a lot of planning goes into it. You're drawing the athlete into it. Technical staff know about it as well. You're then looking for those moments. So actually when we had that high density of games, it wasn't a bad time for Eddie to be introduced into training and be with the team because he was not going to get exposed to kind of really high intense training sessions because they just didn't exist because we were playing so many games. And this is a nice little breath of fresh air here with this week uh, yeah. of Eddie Ginder. So that's, that's no, no time is lost, really. No, none at all. And yeah. it is a mini preseason for a couple of the guys. Guys that didn't get a lot of minutes, we're using this as a loading phase. All right, hey, let's get something into you because then we have a game. Actually, the schedule looks pretty decent now. We have one more density period coming up, but certainly not eight games in uh, 28 days. So we're avoided thing. Uh, fa I know I speak for Vince. Yeah, this is fascinating. I know the viewers there, and I, I, I wish that some young players out there could get that opportunity to get the full allotment of uh, performance uh, guidance. We're not there yet, but I think your, your, your presence here is going a long way, certainly for the folks in Los Angeles. Well, thank you so much. Great chat with you, too. Well, yeah, can no I ask one, I just one more question? Yeah. One more quick question, because it's something that viewers bring to me often. I can't answer it. Yeah. In the game, and let's assume that uh, there's no injuries, there's no you know, emergency moments, you send the guys out at a certain minute in the first half, yes. knowing that they're probably not going to go in. And people always ask me, why are they out there? Like, yeah. what are they doing? Can you fill them in? Because they see them, obviously, at bank. They're running along yeah. near the 3252, and they're wondering, is Steve thinking about making a sub? I know that that maybe not exactly is the point, but could you fill them in on what's going on? Because it gets asked to me a, a lot. Excellent question. So <laughs> he, he lit up when you asked that. He said <laughs> this big grin on his face. He's like, okay. Well, Break good, opportunity, good opportunity <laughs> to explain. So, yes, the guys on the bench, all they want to do is just watch the game, right? They don't want to get up. So when I look across to them and I'm like, let's go, all of them are like heads down and they're, they're not into it at all. So the idea behind it is um, they, were, they did a mini warm-up as kind of part of the pregame. Uh, again, in case something does happen, like in the first couple of minutes, a guy goes down. That just before halftime is kind of more get up off your seats, let's go down to the corner, let's get ourselves moving because we want to encourage them during halftime to be doing some kind of movement in preparation for, there are some times that it's a halftime sub, but then I'll know it and then I'll kind of accelerate their warm-ups a little bit more, but it's so that they're just not sitting for a straight 45 minutes in kind of that seated position. Then you're taking them down in that second half, and then it's also just about good communication, knowing when guys are ready to actually come back onto the field. So next time you see Gavin there you on go. the field, you, you're at well, the no, stadium, you can go, there is that moment. There's People that moment. would ask, and I would say, I think it's this, but don't quote me on it. Yeah. Quote him on it. <laughs> good stuff. We're very fortunate to have you, Gavin, and thanks yeah. for joining us here on the podcast. That'll put a bow on another Inside LFC, the Max Events podcast. Please leave a review. Leave a review. That's what your homework is. Leave a review and send us on email or on our Twitter handles, okay? Just show it.
It's, it goes a long way. Rate us, tell a friend, and uh, we'll be back. It's been a thrill to be back, and we'll see you again next week. Oh, yes! It knocked on the door!